Welcome to the May 2nd worship service from Omibi Baptist Church. It is our privilege to reach out to you and to bring you a service of music and reflection on the Word of God. I'm Pastor Gordon Finley, and we pray that you may feel encouragement and blessing. At the age of 31, Charles Wesley of England came to an experience of personal salvation through Christ on the 21st of May at the Feast of Pentecost, 1738. Later that year, he wrote this hymn to celebrate the full assurance of salvation that had come to him, that wonderful assurance, and across the almost 300 years since then, it has become one of the most popular of Methodist hymns today. In 2013, the British Broadcasting Corporation conducted a survey of best-loved hymns, and this hymn, And Can It Be, was voted number six in the top 100 hymns in all of the United Kingdom. It has been requested this week by one of our regular listeners, Judy, in Belleville. The words are on the screen if you're able to hum along or to sing. <laughs> In North America, May is the month when we celebrate Mother's Day, and on the first three Sundays of May here at Omimi Baptist Church, we will focus on three Bible mothers who gave at great personal cost. While the role of mother has been celebrated in Greek and Roman and other cultures for thousands of years, our North American Mother's Day first began in 1907, Anna Jarvis offered a celebration in honor of her late mother at the St. Andrew's Methodist Church in Grafton, West Virginia. She wanted to have a day set aside to honor all mothers, and she said, a mother is the one person who has done more for you than anyone in the world. How true. Although Congress rejected a proposal in 1908 to make Mother's Day an official holiday, Public support grew for the idea. It spread all across the American states, and by 1914, 
President Woodrow Wilson signed a proclamation designating Mother's Day, held on the second day in May, as a national holiday to honour all mothers. Someone claims to have surveyed Canadians in how we practice and what, how we celebrate Mother's Day, and they describe it as the most shopped-for day of the year after Christmas. Canadian sons were said to spend an average of $123 on mother each year. Residents of Manitoba were the most generous. Sons in Manitoba budgeted an average of $278 for Mother's Day. A couple of quotes on Mother's Day. Any Mother's Day gift is better than no Mother's Day gift at all. Mother is a person who, seeing there are only four pieces of pie for five people, promptly announces that she never did care for pie. Mothers hold their children's hands for a short while, but their hearts forever. Our scripture reading today is from Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, through to chapter 2, verse 10. Come, Holy Spirit, upon this reading of the Word of God. Open our eyes and our hearts and help us to be receptive to what you would teach us in Christ's name. Amen. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him, plastered it bit with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. And then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes, go. And so the girl went and called the child's own mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. We meet this young couple, these young parents, at several different points in their lives today. First of all, the beginning of the journey as family and the blessings that followed in spite of hardship. Every couple starts out together with hopes and dreams and high expectations. Both Amrad and his wife Jacobed are fourth-generation descendants in the tribe of Levi and fourth-generation Israelites living in Egypt. They are people of faith in a great God who called their ancestor Abraham out of a life of idol worship and of many gods to worshiping the one true God of heaven and earth. They engage in daily prayer and worship, and they obey what God has revealed to them of his instruction for daily life. Now, when they were married, they knew that life in Egypt wasn't going to be any piece of cake. Hebrew men were already being forced into slavery to uh, do slave labor. Taskmasters were appointed over them to squeeze out of them every last ounce of labor possible with the hope that somehow this would reduce the size of families that they were having. It didn't work, of course. Instead, they multiplied all the more. Life is filled with situations that you and I could never have foreseen, problems for which we don't feel prepared, and sometimes decisions that we never thought we would be forced to make. Just growing up and taking our place in life has a way of drawing us into positions that we never bargained for, yet such is real life. Amred and Jochebed had a daughter, Miriam. Some years later, they had a son, Aaron. And then the decree comes from the Pharaoh. No more baby boys are allowed to live. 
All baby boys born into the Hebrew homes are to be thrown into the Nile. And just then, another baby boy is born into their home. The Nile, the place of the Nile crocodile that grows to a gigantic size between 11 feet and 16 feet long and can weigh between 500 and 1600 pounds. And those things are ferocious and they are hungry. Jacobed's natural motherly instinct springs into action. Together as a couple, they remember God's promise to Abraham, recorded in our Bibles back in Genesis 15, verses 13 to 16, that although his descendants shall be aliens in a land not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and shall be oppressed for 400 years, Yet, according to God's own promise, they shall come back here to the land of Canaan in the fourth generation. And so it's as though Jochebed and her husband are saying, now we are the fourth generation. Maybe it's true that the darkest hour comes before the dawn. But Lord, you've just given us a baby boy to protect and to raise. Show us how we are to do this. How long, O oh Lord, how long before you rescue our people as you have promised? They had no idea how close they were to the moment of God's decisive action. In the meantime, they must wait patiently. It reminds me of Phillips Brooks, the best known and well known author of the popular Christmas carol, O oh Little Town of Bethlehem. He was, in fact, a man of peaceful nature, of poise, and of great patience. He was appointed as bishop in the Episcopal Church in New England. One day a friend saw him pacing the floor, demonstrating frustration and anxiety and urgency, and the friend asked him what was wrong. He replied, The trouble is I'm in a hurry, but God is not. Patience is somebody that we all must meet and become acquainted with. If we resent her presence, her stay will feel all the longer. For Jacobed, it was quite stressful. Every day, her baby grew stronger, and so did his lungs. It became more and more difficult to hide him. Neighbors who had been forced to give up their sons, feeling bitter and cheated by life, could not be trusted with her secret. In a dark period of anger and frustration, they might turn informer, endangering her entire family. Never underestimate the creative genius of a mother seeking to protect her helpless baby, her creative ingenuity. We know that Jochebed and Amran took their faith seriously, so there is no doubt that they knelt in prayer regularly, pouring out their hearts unto the Lord. Somehow, some way, totally unknown to everyone, to her came the idea of doing something practical to try to save the situation before God. Part of the inspiration came to her as she breastfed her baby and looked into his face. She noticed that he was beautiful before God, according to Acts 7.20. And Hebrews 11.23 reminds us that they saw that, meaning she and her husband saw that this was no ordinary child. Jewish tradition claims that the face of this baby reflected the Shekinah glory of God. She must do something to protect the life of this most unusual child. And so that was, of course, part of the inspiration. Part of the inspiration also came when she reflected on God's promise to Abraham that in the fourth generation of Israel's time in this far country, the Lord's promise must be fulfilled. They shall come back here in the fourth generation, the Lord had said. Why, we ourselves are already the fourth generation. God, are you going to save us at this time? The writer of Exodus does not tell us exactly how this mother received the God-inspired idea that came to her, but she would appeal to the compassion and the human kindness of another mother who is absolutely desperate to have a son. A secret gleam appears in her eyes. There is hope. Pharaoh's daughter is widely believed by scholars to have been Hatshepsut, the only surviving child of Pharaoh Tutmos I. Her two brothers had died. And according to Egyptian rule, the only way that this princess herself could follow her father as Pharaoh 
she must have a son or a husband. According to tradition, she had a daughter of her own already, but no sons and no husband. In fact, she herself was unable to bear any more children, and so her hopes were non-existent. Scripture tells us that the princess was accustomed to walking along the edge of the Nile with her attendants. And as they walked along the shore, she got in the water to wash. Now, the expression to wash could have, of course, referred to a type of a water ritual, since the Egyptians believed that Osiris, their god of the dead and of life beyond, lived in the Nile River. Or it could have been to wash her clothes. We do know that royal children never delegated the task of washing their clothes to other people. Or it could have been that she got in to bathe in the river. Or maybe, according to the Targum of Jonathan, all Egypt had been afflicted with ulcers, and the daughter of Pharaoh came to wash in the river and to soothe her afflicted areas. We don't know. But she saw something floating among the bulrushes, a lovely handmade lidded basket, and she sent her maid to bring it to her. And now the secret plan of Jochebed comes to light. She had devised a plan that might spare the life of her baby son, the bulrushes mentioned in the King James Version are often described as papyrus, which is very commonly seen growing along the banks of the Nile. She had constructed a basket like a little boat, waterproofing it by applying pitch and tar on the outside, and then making it comfortable with soft material. She gave her son his last good feeding of breast milk, tucked him comfortably into his basket, and when he fell asleep, she transported him down to the water's edge in the early morning, placing him on the water among the flagstones. The gentle rocking motion of the water resembled the rocking motion of the cradle at home. The lid over the basket kept out insects and maintained a constant temperature inside, and the baby slept comfortably. That was until he became hungry in the morning. The princess saw this beautiful handmade basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it to her. And when she opened it, she saw the child crying and took pity on him, being struck with the uncommon beauty of the child. Josephus, the historian of the first century AD, states that the princess called for a nursing mother to come to him, but the baby knew this was not his own mother and refused to feed from her. After several other wet mothers were tried unsuccessfully, then a girl stepped forward and asked, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to, uh, to nurse your child? The princess agrees. And of course, the hungry baby recognizes his own mother and has a very fine breakfast. Seeing this, the princess hires this mother to take the child away and to nurse him for her, and she will pay her wages. Wet nurses were often employed to breastfeed the children of royal families in those days, since breastfeeding was seen as too common and too ordinary a task to be done by the royal mother herself. As a result, Jochebed became one of the first mothers ever to be paid to nurse her own baby. In the writings of St. Jerome, we read that there were several opinions on the subject of weaning. Some maintain that children were always weaned at age five or younger. Others claim that weaning was completed at age 12, but with an explanation. You see, breastfeeding itself would be completed between ages two and three, depending on the situation. But they were weaned from the mother's knee and her care, and from the food of childhood as soon as the child in fact was brought up, but usually by age 12. So when this expression says that when the child was weaned, he was brought to Pharaoh's daughter, it could readily mean that the mother retained him until, let's say, age 11 or 12, which gave her tremendous opportunity to teach him and to prepare him for that big wide world out there that he was going to enter. I would like you to suppose that you are in the position of Moses' real parents. You have a few short years to make a real difference in this young life and character. 
before he's immersed in the palace culture of the Egyptians, where Pharaoh is considered divine, and before he's exposed to the secret arts of the magicians and sorcerers, the wise men of Egypt, before he encounters a culture that worships hundreds of gods, and chief among them is the sun. How can his parents prepare him for all this? How would you, if you were in their shoes? He will be learning the Hebrew scriptures and learn to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's pretty important. He will participate daily in the 18 benedictions of a good Jewish home and in the regular hours of prayer with the family. He will learn to know God by faith and will obediently walk before him. He will learn to pray and learn to trust God to lead and guide his life. When our children are small, we may think there's no hurry in molding their lives and characters, why they'll always remain like wet cement. We may easily wait too long and find that they have now been shaped by a culture and a value system that teaches them not to listen to parents or grandparents, but to develop their own values and to explore their own wishes and whatever it is that they'd like to do, but definitely not to obey their parents. Some tasks then lie before these parents, Jochebed and Amran. To raise the boy to the satisfaction of the princess, obviously that's their main task. And uh, it's going to be very important for them to teach the child to respect the royal court and to behave appropriately among the royal children to develop court-like manners and respect and courtesy and eating habits, to teach Egyptian culture and language and way of life. They also need to teach him to walk the fine line between bonding with his Hebrew parents and yet accepting the princess as his adoptive mother. They will need to teach him to know and to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yet to realize that he must not insist or trouble the Egyptians who believe and practice differently. They need to train him with grace and gravity for the possibility of becoming king someday, but never to forget underneath everything that he shares a common ancestry and heritage with the Hebrews, not the Egyptians, to give him roots and yet to give him wings. As we approach the end of today's message, if you've tried to place yourself in the shoes of invite you now to join me in our prayer time together. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's a great and a wonderful privilege for us to be able to speak to you in prayer, and we know that when we come to talk to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are actually in your presence, in your throne room, so to speak. 
Thank you so much for all that you do for us, how you care for us, and how you look after our world. Even during these days of COVID, we are thankful that so many of us are well and safe. Today, we thank you also for the goodness of life itself, for the opportunity that we have to live and work and learn and, and simply enjoy this lovely playground that you've given to humanity to use. As we now join our voices in the words of the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer, help us to concentrate on what is the intended meaning and to pour out our hearts to you in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. 